you know that if you do a word study, and I did, I had time off, if you do a word study about fruit, it's almost dead even how it's used in the Bible. It's used for why it's changed. It's used for good deeds. It's interchangeable in Scripture. God says, I want you to do good works. And by this I am glorified. First uh, Titus 3.14 Let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. See, the disciples would never have interpreted Jesus' words to only mean evangelism. As people who lived in an agrarian society, they would have understood the fruit symbolized the best result or the sweetest prize in life. Psalm 1, verse 3 says, The righteous man shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf shall also not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. See, in practical terms, fruit represents good works through a thought, an attitude, an action of ours that God values because it glorifies Him. The fruit from your life is how God receives His due honor on earth. In John 15, 8, later in this passage, says, by, my, by this my Father is glorified, that you would bear much fruit. You see, there's a couple types of fruit. There's an inner fruit and an outer fruit. The inner fruit talks about a Christ-like quality that you have developed. For example, in Galatians 5.22 says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are fruits of the Spirit. These are inner fruits that are made manifest because of this deep relationship with Christ that you're focused on. But you can also bear out outward fruit when you allow God to work through you to bring Him glory. That includes sharing your faith. We need to have the same attitude and perspective that the early church lived out. They saw every area of life as an opportunity to bear much fruit. In 2 Corinthians 9, it says this, God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So here's a challenge for you. Do you have the same values in your life that these disciples did? Our motives must be to bring Christ's glory in all that we do. That's why when we're at the train station, we do these little coffee giveaways, and people say, what in the world are you doing? When, we are at, when we're at the library or at, at, at the, uh, uh, the campus, we're giving away bread to hungry students, and they say, why in the world would a church do this? Because God loves you. Your fruit is the only permanent deposit that you have in heaven. Real fruit, inward and outward, always lasts, and it is the reason that you've been saved. John 15, 16 says, I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain. In Ephesians 2, 10, it says, We are created in Jesus Christ for good works. So here's the sticking point. Here's the problem that we're running into. There's a carnality in America that has become Christianity. It truly is. There is a spirit of generosity that the Bible calls us that comes out of when you are focused on this personal relationship with Jesus Christ, no matter if hell is beating down your door. And if you're focused on Jesus Christ, you're focused on this personal relationship that everything in life shall flow out of. Nothing will set at bay your good deeds. Because you see, in Acts 2, 40 through uh, 47, it says it. Your good deeds become this platform for the good news. That's why Jerusalem was turned upside down. Not just because of the preached word, because the preached word had an effect. And no matter how much tension, no matter how many problems, no matter how stressful life was become, the disciples, the true devoted Christ followers, were going to be undeterred. They were going to focus on, I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and hell be damned if anything is going to keep me from serving Jesus Christ. But here's what's happened. We've developed the carnality of our faith in America. We have. I want you to go home and read 2 Peter 3. 
2 Timothy. I didn't read you verses 2 onwards. Because it talks about what life will become if you're not Christ-centered. It's an absolute selfish lifestyle that you lavish upon yourself. The Bible warns us to avoid that. But you should see, that's here, here's the thing. If you're not focused on who Jesus Christ is in your life, and you're focusing on all the problems and issues around you, there's going to be a temptation that you're going to abandon your faith to deal with the problems. Jesus is focused on me and do the good works that I commend. I expect results. God says when you get to heaven, if you're truly a believer in Christ, he's going to judge your works, not to get in, but the motives that you did in serve. Well, I'm talking, turn to Romans 12. This will revolutionize your thinking. Because you see, we're supposed to have this spirit of generosity. The first church had it, you know? It said in, in, in uh, uh, verse 42, 43-ish of Acts chapter 2, it talked about how the, the disciples had all things in common. It wasn't a socialist society. You know what happened? There was 100,000 people that came to Christ. Wow! <laughs> you want to talk about revival? You know, Peter preached that 3,000 people came to Christ. You know what happened after that? They all stayed. It was, it, was the, uh, it was first fruits. It was the feast of first fruits. What happened? People came from hundreds of miles away to, to Jerusalem to celebrate what God had done in their life. They heard the real gospel. They came to Christ. And guess what? They didn't want to go back 700 miles. How are they going to live? They only brought enough for a week. The disciples said, hey, we need to meet needs here. They sold stuff. They said, you know, if you've got a spare room, can you take this family in? That's what they did. When they say they had all things in common, they sold that every person would have their need met. It was because of the fact that so many people were coming to Christ. They were coming from so many countries far away. They had to find a way of putting them up. There was a spirit of generosity in the midst of this Roman oppression. They never looked at it as anything but, I'm serving the king. This is why my buddy, it really hit me last night talking with him about the church he was serving at. This was a big church. This was a church. I mean, it was an epicenter church. The plant closed. They didn't move. They just stopped coming to church because of the problems. And that's one of the things that people in America do. Hard times happen. Blame God. Walk away. God says, bugger on the problem. Serve me. <laughs> you hear that? Have you not been reading what I'm reading here? Jesus says, bugger the problems. Serve me. Do good works. Abide in me. Have much fruit. Be generous. Not selfish. Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren. Now, again, Romans 90, 95%? Slaves? Huge percentage. Huge, huge percentage of, this, of Rome was slaves. High 90s, okay? These were slaves. What's a slave? Let's know what he's saying here. I appeal to you, brethren. My brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith God has assigned. For as by one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, but so we as many are one body in Christ, and individually members one with another, having gifts that are different according to the grace given to us, let us use them in prophecy in proportion to our faith. If it's service, in serving one another, in the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation or encouragement, and the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, 
And the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Here's the mark. Let love be genuine. Afford evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another by showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Consistent in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. And seek to show hospitality. Because of those who bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We are called to live lives of generosity, not selfishness. And here's what's happened in America. One of two things. <clears throat> Hard times. People walk away. To hell with God. <coughs> Serious. I'm a pastor. I've been doing this 30 years now. And I'm telling you, I see it all the time. <coughs> or, or, they start putting their trust in their own personal strength. They put their trust in working out their own circumstances. And it leads to a <coughs> consumer mentality. You see, God has called you and I to become purveyors of the faith, not consumers of the faith. When you get involved in a church, you should be getting involved in a ch church not because it will meet your need, but because you know that you've been gifted to the needs. That's key. That's key. That's what God is saying here in the garden. He's walking up this hill, and he grabs this vine, and he says, Abide me, and have much fruit. Ignore the troubles. Press in. Own fruit. That's how you get the tough times. Because when you focus on me, I'm going to close with this. I have found some a secret. This is a cool secret. This will change your life. My wife and I found that our 31 years of marriage, when we were consistently focused on meeting other people's needs, God somehow, some way, comes around behind us and takes care of us. Hmm. That makes tithing when you don't have it easier. That makes meeting a need in somebody's life a whole lot easier. Because you know, somehow, some way, God, Daddy will take care of you. It's about kingdom, it's about focus, it's about your perspective in trouble. So here's the challenge today. I want you this week. I really want you this week to think about how do you react to trouble? Problems. Do you look at life as totally insurmountable? Or do you fully rely, fully trust in as, as Psalm 37 talks about who God is? Either he's exactly who he says he is, or the biggest liar and fraud in the world. Either he is our provider. He is our Lord. He is the Father of the universe. He has control over everything. And you need a need in his time. Or, who's your phone? Prove God. Prove God. 